in the IRA, I don't have to worry about taxes. So that's where I will tend to do more swing trading. That's where I swing trade a lot of TQQQ. If I have like a buffer, I will wait until the end of the week because a lot of times things will smooth themselves out. Since I set my stop loss based on the 10 week moving average or the 50 day moving average, I try to buy as close to that as possible. When I buy individual stocks, I'm only buying ones that have the potential to be true market leaders. I want them to have the potential to double or triple over time. When I start finding individual stocks to buy, I start selling down the TQQQ and going into the individual stocks. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Trailline Podcast brought to you by the Ultimate Trading Guide. You can pick up your free copy down below. I'm your host, Richard Moglin, and joining us today is someone who I've wanted to chat with uh, for you know many years in the making. Uh, we have Viva Ja, who is a top performer in the US Investing Championship uh, for the three years that she's entered, uh, starting in 2020. In 2021, she entered the Money Manager Division, had a triple digit year. Uh, this year in 2023, uh, she's also on track for super performance. So um, yeah, really looking forward to diving into her process, her techniques, her setups, and uh, Viva, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, yeah, great to have you. Hi, Richard. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to um, connecting with you as well. Yeah, perfect. And I always like to kind of bring it back to the very beginning. Uh, I know your story is a little bit different than, than some other people I've interviewed. So I'd love to hear about how you first got interested in investing and how that transitioned to also trading and, and finally entering the U.S. Investing Championship and performing extremely well. Sure. Um, so yes, as you said, my background is definitely different from a lot of the people you've had on your show. Um, I grew up in a family that was not at all into stock trading. Um, my family is immigrants. My dad is an engineer. Uh, you know, he taught us to save money and not go into debt, but generally stock trading was not something that we did. And I first became exposed to um, stock investing through my brother, who uh, he's a computer engineer and his first job was with Goldman Sachs. And so in the mid 90s, he started to share with me about Microsoft and all these technology stocks, but I was still very conservative at that point. I wasn't interested. And then in 1999, two things happened. Um, I was on maternity leave, so I was actually home and I had time to watch CNBC and, and keep track of everything that was going on. And the brother who worked at Goldman Sachs, he, uh, his company actually went to IPO. And we were one of the original investors. So during that 1999 time, we saw a pretty big return on our investment. And I thought, wow, you know, this stock trading, I was really nervous about it, but it's kind of easy, you know, when I looked at Microsoft. And so I got in in December of 1999 and I proceeded to watch my account drop by 80% over the next year. Um, the IPO, we were in the lockup period, so we couldn't get out. Same thing, it went from maybe Oof. like $100 down to $3 <laughs> before we could get out. And um, it was a very humbling experience, but at the same time, what I realized is that th there's definitely an opportunity to make money here, but you need to know what you're doing. And so at that point, I committed to I was going to learn. And so for the next 10 years, so from like 1999 to 2009, I really spent that time starting to learn. So at that point, I was, um, you know, I don't know if I had shared with you my background. I worked for Aetna for a long time. I was a corporate executive there. I was focused on growing my, my career. I was focused on raising my family. So even though I was interested in investing, it was kind of like a little bit on the back burner. Um, and the way I started learning about it is, again, in those times, I used to travel to California. I had a team of people out there. We didn't have Wi-Fi. People didn't have their smartphones. So when I was on a plane for seven or eight hours, I was reading investing books. So I was reading Peter Lynch at the time, Motley Fool, like really just trying to understand like the fundamentals, trying to understand that, okay, Microsoft was a great company, but I bought it at the wrong time and I lost a lot of money. So how do I avoid that? And so for kind of like 10 years of my journey, it was very slow. And then um, in 2009, at that time, I used to get like the AAII newsletter. And um, they, uh, on the back cover, they actually had done like an analysis of the CanSlim methodology. And what I saw on the back cover was they said over an 11 year period that they had looked at, CanSlim returned 35.2% per year over that 11 year period. And as I had been getting into investing, like my goal was to try to like triple or double my money every like three to five years. And, you know, like that rule of 72. So when I thought, right. okay, if I can get a 35% return, I can double my money every two years. I need to learn this system. And that's what got me into how to make money in stocks. And again, it's a lot harder. You don't just make 35% per year, but that's what 
kind of opened my eyes to, you know, I was thinking, oh, you know, I can do 15% per year. It's better than investing in like an index fund. But I, but then I thought, no, like this is a system that has worked over a long period of time. I'm going to learn this. And that's when I really started getting into Can Slim, how to make money in stocks. Um, I did that for a couple of years, again, still working full time. And then eventually by 2013, I was at a point where I was able to generate as much from my investment earnings. And again, at that point, I'd built up capital as well as I was from my job as a corporate executive. So then I decided to leave my job and focus on trading full time. Yeah, wonderful. And and how did you dive into the cancel methodology? Was it through his book? Did you attend workshops? What was kind of your your kind of education process for that? Yeah, I, I you know, that's one of my big regrets is that I never had a chance to attend any of the live workshops. So basically, the way that I started, I did read the book. And um, I have actually the green version of how to make money in stocks. At that time, it used to come with a CD. And there was like a free, I think, two week or four week subscription. So that's sort of how I started. And again, at that time, again, because I was juggling this with work and with my family, I used to invest on a quarterly basis. And the reason I invested on a quarterly basis is because that's when I had income coming in that I could put into the market. And so at that time, what I would do, because I didn't have time to follow it on a daily basis, is I would sign up like every few months for like a month of, of IBD. And then I would incorporate like the ratings. I would incorporate like the, the, the um, you know, buying uh, when stocks were emerging out of basis, buying when the market is in an uptrend. I incorporated that into those quarterly timeframes when I was ready to put money into the market. And it really wasn't until 2013 when I quit my job that I started to actually start paying attention on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. I still think that my bias is still longer term. Mm -hmm. So um, when I buy, I try and some of this again came from my background working in at Aetna trying to grow the business there. You know, it sometimes it seems easy when you're thinking about quarterly earnings, but the amount of effort it takes a company to come up with their strategy, to come up with an annual operating plan, to see the results of those plans, it takes time. And if you want to hold, if you want to buy and and grow those com or if you want to hold on to those companies that have an opportunity to grow the way some of the things and how to make money in stocks grow, you have to give them time to develop. And so that's why I tend to have a little bit of a, a longer term view, but I have definitely learned that if I incorporate the technicals in addition to the fundamentals, I've been able to significantly improve my results after doing that. Yeah. And everybody has their strength and, you know, thinking more long-term isn't a bad thing. It's just a style choice. So um, yeah, I, I want to, I want to hear a little bit more about um, how you think your, your prior career influenced how you trade and, and how you kind of view the markets. If you want to, uh, if, if there's anything, you know, clear that comes to mind. Yeah, sure. So I think it definitely played a much bigger role um, up until 2013 when I was at Aetna um, because of my role. So I was the PNL owner for a business division that we called Key Accounts. And in that division, I was responsible for developing the business strategy and the overall execution of growing our business in that in that segment. And as part of that, like we used to do quarterly business reviews, we would have to before we would report earnings out to Wall Street, we would have our internal reviews. I was very much like connected to what was going on with the overall economy, what was happening with inflation, what was happening with so many different like macro factors. Right. And so, um, and also in that role, because um, Aetna was acquiring companies too, I would be sometimes involved in that due diligence of researching, okay, if there's smaller companies that have like a niche in something Aetna wanted to get into, you know, is this a company that we want to acquire? So the way that that informed my strategy is when I was looking for individual stocks, I was thinking of them almost as if I were like a venture capitalist or if I were, and again, some of those companies were big. It's not like I could ever as a venture capital capitalist even buy them, but I was yeah. thinking, would I want to invest in this business? Mm -hmm. And, and, um, you know, if I want to invest in this business, what are the kinds of things that I'm looking for? And that's where my background kind of helped me with that piece of it. Since I left Aetna, now I don't have access to all of all of that same information. So I get my information same as everybody else does. So now I definitely have come to rely more on what's happening with the price and volume action 
um, in order to kind of interpret what's happening. And then the one other thing I would have to say is that at that time, I also used to listen to the earnings reports and having been on the other side of where we have to prepare for the earnings and how we're going to share it with Wall Street, I kind of knew how to read between the lines. And there, there's never, um, I shouldn't say never, but the majority of times there's not going to be a business that's going to tell you our business sucks right now and the next quarter is going to be horrible. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of learn to read. And I always cared as much about the outlook as I did about the past because the past was okay. It's important to know what they have a proven track record, but the share price is going to move based on what they can deliver in the future, right? Like that's what the market cares about. So I kind of learned to read between the lines when I was listening to earnings and evaluating earnings of various companies to try to understand like, okay, you know, did they deliver on what they said they were going to do and what's their outlook going forward? And is this a company that I want to hold for 12 to 18 months or longer? If not, then I would get out. Very cool. And in, in this learning period, uh, before you really became comfortable, what were some of the kind of key mistakes that you found yourself kind of making over and over again? Uh, you, you mentioned, you know, holding holding a stock that you're kind of stuck in for 80% drawdown, which is never fun, of, of course. But um, what were some kind of some key things that that now looking back on what you were doing, you're like, hey, if I had changed those things, I that's really what led to improving my performance, improving my results, improving my consistency, all of that. Yeah, the single biggest thing was limiting losses. So that 80% loss that happened in 1999, luckily that did not happen again. <laughs> I did I did learn from that. But the part that I struggled with the most, there were a few things I struggled with, like when it came to like the canceling thing. For the most part, it all completely resonated with me. But the parts that I had a hard time with, number one was like the size um, of trying to get very concentrated positions. Mm. And the reason that I struggled with that was because I wasn't really able to, and again, now things are different because literally, you know, you can pick up your phone and, and set alerts and figure out what's happening even while you're in the middle of a meeting. At that time, you couldn't do that. So because I was away and a lot of times I was traveling or even when I wasn't traveling, I was working 60, 70 hours a week. I didn't have time to watch exactly what was going on. So a few of the times when I tried to go in with bigger size and, you know, there would be a 20% drawdown or 20% gap down because of earnings. If I had a big position, even if everything else looked great up until that point, there was nothing I could do about that. And so like I was experiencing drawdowns that I felt like I really didn't have that much control over at that time. So that was one thing. Um, and, and then the other thing that I struggled with is I definitely understood the importance of risk management and stop loss. Like when I started my career at Aetna, I was a financial underwriter. So risk was basically like, I remember like our, our, the vice president of our division, when I started underwriting, he said, our, our responsibility was to the shareholders of the company because like we had to protect the financials of, of Aetna. So I've always been paid attention to risk, but the thing that I had a hard time with was the seven to 8% um, stop mm -hmm. loss. And not because of the numbers, like I could completely get the math that if you lose seven or 8%, you can, it's much easier to come back from that. But based on the charts I was looking at, when I had a seven to 8%, I would send it, set up like automated stop loss um, because I couldn't keep an eye on it. It didn't really seem to make sense with a technical spot on the chart. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the lessons that like I would set up the automatic 8%. A lot of times it would hit the thing, it would turn back around. And when I went back and looked at it, I, I other than the fact that it was 7 or 8%, I couldn't really understand why it made sense on the chart for me to pick that. So what I learned from that was for me, I needed to set like a more of a technical stop loss. And because I tended to have that longer term focus and for so much of the time that I started um, doing Can Slim, I just used Investors Business Daily. I didn't even have Market Smith until I entered the competition, the USIC competition. So I focused on the 50 day and the 10 week. So I position sized based on, okay, if it were to come down, to the 50 day or the 10 week. And I, I tried to buy when it was like within 10% of that, but sometimes I couldn't always control that. But mm -hmm. I, I tried to set a technical stop loss that would allow it to come down to that level. And because of a lot of what, how to make money in stocks, they did say off, Bill O'Neill did say many times that it can go back. Sometimes it'll leave an undercut for a week or two, but if it's in an orderly fashion, that doesn't mean the stock is broken. You have to definitely watch it. That I felt resonated more with my way of managing risk. So, um, so kind of like the, 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 the conclusion of that is that 
even for concentrated positions, I generally don't start with more than 10%. Um, if it organically grows from there, because again, I'm trying to buy companies that have the potential to double and triple, I will let it grow as long as it's acting right. But I have not, with, with my style and the amount of time that I spend on a daily basis monitoring, I have not felt comfortable with 20 or 25% positions unless it is swing trading TQQQ, which I can talk about later. Yeah, definitely. I, I want to talk about that for sure. I'll, I'll actually write that down. No, that, that that's helpful context. And, you know, taking a step back, um, how much of your process now do you find uh, is fundamental based versus technical based? And I also think it's helpful to give context for, for people watching. What, what's kind of um, your goal time frame to hold a trade? So how, how long would you like to hold a winner and also a loser is... You want to kick it out as soon as possible, I'm sure, but love yes. to hear that as well. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I'll I'll tell you more what my overall strategy is for the investing championship. It's a little bit different because it's just a one year um, and it's a one calendar year. So, if you're buying something in November, it only matters what it did by December 31st. So, it's not even technically one year, depending on when you get into things. So, generally, my time frame, I like to be able to hold things for at least 12 to 18 months. Because when you look at a lot of the true market leaders, if you get in early enough, and the way I define early enough is that like in How to Make Money in Stocks, Bill O'Neill does talk about early stage basis. So a little bit different from obviously Stan's analysis of, of stage analysis, but more from like a base count of when you're emerging either after a correction or after it has undercut the lows of a prior base. I try to, if it's something that I want to hold for 12 to 18 months, which is generally my goal for individual stocks, is I try to get in when it is at either a stage one or a stage two. Mm -hmm. um, if I want to hold it for 12 to 18 months or with a goal of holding it to 12 to 18 months. And as long as it's acting right, I will hold it as long as it as there's the rising 50 day moving average, the 10 week moving average. And as long as it even if it comes down the first time it comes down, as long as it doesn't you know, come down like a knife, if yeah. it comes down kind of gradually um, or if the overall market is pulling back and it's coming back in conjunction with that versus something that's like something fundamentally wrong with the business itself, I'll let it come down to that point. Um, but if it like, you know, severely undercuts it, or if like the, the business strategy has changed. So even now I do still pay attention to earnings. I don't listen to the earnings reports as much anymore, but now you can get so much information. Like I'll watch how the stock reacts after earnings for even a couple of weeks after. And I also, if there's something major that happened, either a gap up or gap down, there's typically articles out there that tell you sort of what the company communicated. So if, if either they're, technicals have really fallen very badly, or if the business strategy has changed or the leadership has changed, or I no longer have conviction in the company, then I'll get out sooner. Otherwise I try to hold for 12 to 18 months. When it comes to how much of my process is fundamental versus technical, I always start with the fundamentals. So mm -hmm. it's hard for me to put a percentage on it because even if a chart looks great, and again, like I'm still like a relative newbie when it comes to true technicals. Like, yes, I've been doing it for five years, but I'm not like, you know, I'm not a CMT. I don't, I, I tend to look at sort of the bigger bases. I'm not like that um, uh, good about figuring yeah. out the little nuances. Um, but in order for it to even get on my like focus list, it has to meet my fundamentals. And once it meets my fundamentals, then I do definitely look at, you know, is it emerging out of a sound base? Um, you know, like how is the overall market doing? And I know like a lot of the people that you've talked to, they focus on like the ground up. Um, for me, like one of the things that resonated with me when I read How to Make Money in Stocks is that three out of four stocks will follow the general market. And because my expertise is not the technical, I, I still feel more comfortable with the fundamentals. I want the odds in my favor. So when the market is like, you know, in, in a correction, I will tend to probably sit back a little bit and wait for it to really show that it has turned around. Yeah, perfect. And your, your goal obviously is to hold for that full kind of 12 to 18 months. Um, do you have a sense of kind of what your average hold period for a winner actually is? Because that might be a little bit different than that overall goal of, of 12 to 18. Yeah, it, it varies. I usually will um, evaluate... Again, I evaluate on a quarterly basis, but generally once 12 months have gone by, I try to look at like, okay, is there anything else out there that I would rather have? And costs, so if yeah. I, so when I'm comparing that, okay, like for example, um, if I have something and it's gone up, like say 
70% or whatever, and then I have my eye on something else that I think has the potential to go up 100% based on where they are, I'll get rid of that one. But, you know, I do still have a handful of stocks. I have NVIDIA from 2016, not the whole thing. I sold a bunch of it as it went up, but I still have a, a, a position in NVIDIA. I have a position in Shopify from 2016. Um, I have a position in Trade Desk from 2020. And again, I would sell, like, when, when the market really started pulling back, I sold enough so that, like, I had even if it like goes down to zero, I will have still done very well. But there are companies that I still believe in their story. And having them in my portfolio allows me to follow them more closely than if I just sold them and got out. But yeah, on so average, I would say, like, probably I'm holding things somewhere between 12 and 24 months. Yeah, very cool. But when they do well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And um, I also would like to hear uh, if, if you've got them kind of your your batting average um, your average win and average loss, if if you had those statistics, and uh, it'd be interesting to know, you know, how many of the stocks that you you start positions in end up becoming like a Shopify and Nvidia, you know, a big winner for you, because obviously there's winners and then there's the mega winners that really move the needle. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I do have the statistics for like the U.S. investing, my results in the U.S. investing championship um, for my non-U.S. investing championship, which is kind of like the account that we live off. My batting average is much higher. It's like in the 70 to 75 percent range. But it's because I hold things longer and yeah. because based on the position size, I will actually let things come down 10 to 15 percent. When I say 10 to 15 percent, they're not huge positions when I start. So typically, like, as I said, I size to like the, the 10 week moving average once I have. And if I buy at the right time, which if I'm buying like when the stock has just started to emerge out of a correction, usually it doesn't end up going down 10 or 15 percent. You know, yeah. so even though like I'm sizing to the the ten week moving average, oftentimes it doesn't go down that low because I'm buying it as it's like retaking that. Um, but again, because I have a wider swing there, I think it allows me to stay on things longer. And the U.S. Investing Championship. So the funny thing is, I, I looked at my numbers for 2021 and for 2023. 2020 was a great year for everybody. So I think everybody, or not everybody, but a lot of people had very good percentages. So in um, 2021, I my batting average was around 50%. I had a total of 36 trades, 19 were losers and 17 were winners. But of the 17 that were winners, my overall gain was five times what the loss was. So it was like a, you know, like a five wow. R, as you, what you would yep. say. 2023 was very different. 2023, I really struggled because the type of companies I like to buy, I was really having a hard time. Um, and I'll go through SMCI at some point. I bought it even though it didn't perfectly meet what I wanted. I made some money, but it, I don't think it was a good trade. So in 2023, I probably had my worst year when it comes to batting average. I had only 10, when I say 10 trades, like I did trade in and out of position. So there are only 10 tickers that I traded. Seven were losers. Mm -hmm. Three were winners, but I still had an overall four. And you'll see when the final results come out. I myself don't know what the overall results are right now, but my um, results did improve from the last time I reported. So, but the the gains were four times what the losses were. So even with just three out of 10, like I had close to a 70% return in 2023. Yeah, perfect. And in 2021, that was kind of an interesting year because it was more choppy breakouts and fall through. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of your, your numbers for that year? For 2020 or 2021? 2021. Yeah. yeah, 2021 is where I had the the under 50% batting average. Gotcha. And um, I had a total of 36 trades, 19 were losers, 17 were winners, and the winners were five times higher than the losers in terms gotcha. of the overall gain versus overall loss. Perfect. And uh, and I just want to say congratulations because, uh, you know, that's fantastic performance. And, uh, you know, uh, I also, it's very it's awesome that you're competing at the money manager division level as well, $1 million plus and getting those type of returns. So that's fantastic. And I'd love to hear about what actually got you to decide to enter the U.S. Investing Championship and, and hear about, you know, that over, overall experience and what that's been like. Yes. Yeah. So when I first read how to make money in stocks and in that um, Bill O'Neill did talk about David Ryan and and I just the whole idea of the competition really appealed to me because for most of my career, most of my career, worked in corporate America, you're always getting rated. You always kind of know where you stand. 
When I left my job, I didn't really have any basis of comparison. And I felt overall that my results were good. You know, my husband would share information with like his friends and colleagues and all these people would come up to me and say, oh, you know, like, can you manage my money? Like you're doing really well. And I was like, well, I have no idea. Like I'm just learning this myself, you know? And so when I heard that that um, Norm was redoing the competition, I thought, you know, I want to just do this for two reasons. One, because I like to challenge myself and I wanted to see, OK, like it feels like I'm doing pretty well. But how do I stack up against people who maybe they've been doing this for a long time? Like this is like their full time thing. I'm just kind of still a little bit of a novice at yeah. this. And the other reason is because when I did take that time off from work, I was so passionate and excited about trading like literally I mean like it sounds so nerdy but like on Saturday mornings I would get up and I would have my investors business daily and like I would spread it out on the island and I would like pick the companies I wanted and you know even my husband and my kids like they know all my symbols of like you know what I'm doing and so I thought like wow like if I could do this and get paid for it like that would be like really cool so I entered the competition thinking okay my background was political science and Spanish had no no background at all in investing. If I can prove myself on a playing field with other people that might be doing this professionally, then maybe I'll have enough of a track record that, that I'll be able to go work for like a hedge fund or maybe start something on my own. So that's what got me interested um, in joining the competition. And I think overall the experience has been really good. You know, when I um, when I joined the MMVR in 2021, uh, it, Mark was obviously like, it was just an honor to be in the same division as him. Like I, you know, people can believe in themselves, but I'm also not um, delusional. <laughs> and like, but I just wanted to see like, can I show up and do my best and in that division perform really well? And I was yeah. proud of my, my results there. And I think it helped me see that, okay, whatever my style is that, I am able to consistently deliver again, like 2023, I did not have a triple digit year, but the kinds of um, setups and the kinds of things I looked for, I was having trouble finding them. And I was starting to force some trades, which is why I had the seven um, out of the 10 trades I did, seven didn't work. But then I realized, luckily they weren't huge losses. I realized, you know, my style is not working. So I'm going to go to what is working, which we'll talk about TQQQ for me work. And I I'm not going to force myself to do things that don't make sense with what has worked for me yeah yeah no that, that's that's perfect and um i'm sure uh, there's a lot of other stock market nerds out there watching this especially if you're watching up until now so you're not alone i'm one as well um and this is a little bit of a side but I, I read an article on on kind of your process and and uh kind of how you were doing things and it might be good talking about just because it's kind of interesting general finance is um or do you mostly do your trading in IRAs, Roth IRAs, brokerage? How, how do you kind of handle that? Uh, you know, personally, um, I've got a brokerage, I've got my Roth, and obviously the Roth has so many compounding advantages over time. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on that. Yes. So I have a little bit of everything. And because I actually um, help out my family members too. So I have, you know, from my 24-year-old uh, daughter to my, you know, mom who's in her mid-70s and my dad, like, so it's kind of like the whole gamut of people's time frame. So I have like a couple of main accounts. So basically, like when I left Aetna, I took my 401 with me and I ended up investing it on my own. Mm -hmm. I can't touch that money for another five years. Mm -hmm. So that's where I really tend to kind of experiment with different approaches because as long as I can recover, which so far it's all worked out well, but that's where like, I don't need the money right now. I do have a brokerage account, which is where we basically live off. Like since I, and again, my husband is still working, but ever since I quit my job, that's where like we take money out of that every year. It covers like what I used to draw down, what I used to bring in in terms of from a salary perspective, sometimes more than that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I do manage that, that one because it is uh subject to taxes. That's why in that account, I try to purchase the types of stocks that I feel I can hold for 12 to 18 months unless Makes they sense. like hold against me. Um, mm -hmm. In the IRA, I don't have to worry about taxes. So that's where I will tend to do more swing trading. That's where I swing trade a lot of TQQQ because I don't have to worry about the tax implications. Um, and then Roth, uh, by the time they rolled the Roth out, I was not eligible for it. So I kind of backdoored into the Roth, but I, because like, you know, you have to pay taxes at the time that you're converting for the most part, I wasn't able to put that much in there. So it's a very small percentage of my portfolio. 
Yeah, it makes sense. And just especially for the younger viewers out there, if you can take advantage of the Roth IRA, do it, look into it for sure. Um, perfect. Um, and and yes. that's what like with, with my kids, the moment they got their first full-time job, they immediately had to open Roths. Um, perfect. So they both have had Roths for, for years now. Yeah, I was lucky enough. My, my parents did the same thing, and I'm definitely grateful for that. And um, and yeah, no, no, I think uh, the Roth IRA, I mean, t definitely take advantage of it if, if you can. So um, awesome. Uh, that, that's some great context. I'd love to dive deeper now into your style. And once again, uh, congrats on your performance. Triple digit years in the money manager division. Uh, another excellent performance, I'm sure, for 2023. Uh, based on how the results are, are coming, we'll see the final numbers. Uh, but yeah, take me through kind of your your overall strategy, maybe from a high level. And then I'd love to dive into your routine setups. We'll definitely share some charts. And I know you've got some uh, trades planned out to, to go through. Yeah, sure. So overall, my process is, um, it, you know, it, it hasn't changed that much from when I really started with Investors Business Daily. So basically, I do most of my research on the weekend. Um, I use like the weekly paper. And the reason I still like the paper, I know it's old school, but when I circle things or underline them or highlight them or write things down, it stays in my brain better. Yeah. So even if I don't look at the hard copy again, like the symbols just start, the tickers start like kind of, I, I start internalizing them. Mm -hmm. So basically what I do, and, and I use a lot of the, the criteria that's in how to make money in stocks. I've tweaked them a little bit based on like when I look at what my big winners were, but you know, I will typically look for to kind of start the process. I start with the um, IBD 50. Um, I look at sector leaders and I look at IPO leaders. So those are the three screens from IBD that I, that are my starting point. Mm -hmm. And what I'm looking for is uh, the first place that I start is like the quarterly earnings and sales. Um, you know, Bill O'Neill recommends 25% or higher. Most of my um, stocks that have done really well tend to be in the 30 to 35% or higher when they first start out. So if I see that they have 35% earnings and sales, I put an asterisk next to it because like that's one that I definitely want to pay attention to. But I look for 25% annual earnings growth, 25% um, quarterly earnings, quarterly sales. And then I do also look at the next quarter projected earnings. Mm -hmm. um, based on my experience even with Aetna, it, it's very hard to predict out too far in advance. So I will generally look at the next quarter and I do look at what's expected for like the upcoming year. Beyond that, it doesn't matter how good of a, a, a you know, um, predictor you are, something like COVID can happen, something can happen with one of your competitors. It's really, really hard to predict too far out. So I tend to look at the next quarter and then the upcoming year. And I want there to be generally ideally 25% or more, but at least 20%. So if it kind of meets those four criteria, then it's going to kind of go on my focus list where I drill down more. So once it meets that criteria, I do look at comp ratings. Um, I, I will look at the, the EPS rating, the comp rating. Typically, when it's in the, the, the top 15 of the IBD 50, they tend to be 98s and 99s. Um, even if it's like 95 or higher, generally, like I'm, I'm fine with that. I look at the RS. And in addition to the RS rating, which I like to be above 95, I look at the RS line because you know the RS rating incorporates a longer period of time. I want to see like how is the line performing now. Right. Um, so that's definitely something that I look at. Um, I will look at the industry group. So I don't start with industry groups. I start with kind of like those quarterly earnings and sales. But a lot of times, like when I look at the IBD 15, there will be stocks. So for example, like right now, you know, when you look at like the CrowdStrike, the Z-Stalers, they're all in similar groups. Right. So as I'm going through the 15, I'll start to get a sense of, wow, you know, I'm seeing a lot of software stocks or I'm seeing a lot of this type. And so then that just kind of, you know, will put that in my head of, okay, like this is probably an industry group to watch. So those are some of like the fundamental criteria that I start out with. Then I will put that into like I have um, on MarketSmith, I actually have like three watch lists that I've created. So one is sort of like my, it's sort of like my universal list, which will be things that maybe right now they aren't hitting the 25% earnings and sales, but they could be hitting other criteria. So for example, I really like New America because I'm trying to find like, what are some of the new emerging leaders? They might not necessarily have the fundamentals right now, but I want to get them onto like 
somewhere so that I'm looking at them at least on a weekly basis to see if something new is emerging. Um, if there's a stock in the IBD 50 or in IPO leaders or sector leaders where either the earnings or sales are triple digit, even if it doesn't meet any of my other criteria, I plop it into that broader list because I want to start watching like what's going on or start to right. learn about about that company. Um, the companies that do meet my fundamental criteria, they go on what I call my focus list. Those are the ones where now I'm gonna start watching them on a weekly, possibly even daily basis. And I'm gonna start looking for, are they setting up? Mm -hmm. And so a few of the tickers that we'll go through later today, they're on my focus list of they meet a lot of my fundamental criteria, but they aren't yet at at least for my comfort level, and again, as I said, like I'm sure there's people who are very good with technicals that can probably find, you know, maybe area periods of tightness for just one or two days and they feel comfortable jumping in. I'm generally not not like that. So I need it to like set up a little bit more traditionally before I feel jumping in from a technical perspective. And then my final list that I have is once it's met my technical and my fundamental criteria, and I'm actually ready to create a trading plan for it, meaning where do I want to buy? How much do I want to buy? Where do I want to set my stop loss? What are my expectations? Then I put that what I call my A list. And those are the ones that like, if they move, I'm ready to like buy them tomorrow if they move. So those are kind of like, I go through that process on a weekly basis. And then in addition, on a weekly basis, I look at everything I already currently own. Um, so most of the time I focus on weekly charts. I will on a, I'm sorry if I'm jumping all over the place, on no, a daily good. basis, on a daily basis, I will look at like, so I do sort based on price change. And so like at the end of the day, I take a minute or two to sort by both what's gone up the most and what's gone down the most to see is there something that's potentially triggering a sell signal and if there's something that's triggering a potential success triggering a potential sell signal i will move it into a sell signal folder i typically wait till the end of the week particularly if i have like a buffer i will wait until the end of the week because a lot of times things will smooth themselves out and so i will give it to the end of the week as long as like it has not violated my stop mm -hmm. Um, and, and then at the end of the week, but at least like that also helps me get a sense of how the overall market is doing. Cause again, I will look at like, like the market pulse and distribution days, but like if my folder, my market Smith folder that has sell signs, if all of a sudden there's a lot more tickers going in there, it's telling me, okay, like I can't do my weekly process. I need to start paying attention on a daily basis. Makes sense. Um, another thing that I also track is on a spreadsheet, I will put, and this is something I'm trying to get better at in terms of drawdowns. And I think when I had talked to you before, I mentioned that because I try to hold things for a longer move, I do have to deal with drawdowns. And for the most part, I'm fine with that. But I'm trying to kind of thread that needle between <clears throat> a drawdown that's acceptable, but at the same time, like when I start having like a three to 4% drawdown from my overall peak, I want to start paying attention. Perfect. And and following up on your routine, um, how long in general does that kind of weekly process generally take uh, on average? So, so it depends. A, a lot of times, like the same tickers tend to repeat on the IBD 50 sector leaders and on IPO leaders. So it's, um, you know, like when I'm first kind of starting after having been away from it for like a few weeks. So for example, like October, November, December, I wasn't really that watching things as closely because of the holidays. We had gone to India with spotty internet. So at the beginning of this year, when I was really kind of getting into it, it was, it would take me like, I would say one to two hours on the weekend mm -hmm. just to kind of do my research, identify the tickers, put stuff into my folders. Um, on a daily basis, I probably spend from like like, so definitely like I, before the market opens, I want to look at what's going on. Like, is there anything that moved overnight? Um, definitely want to be aware of anything that's reporting earnings, either stocks I'm interested in or stocks I already own so that I have a plan before the market opens of how I'm going to react to those. At the end of the day, from like four to 4.30, I spend half an hour. I um, will put in basically like what my balances are on certain accounts that I monitor closely again, because I'm trying to track like once they've peaked, like how far are they pulling back from there. Right. Um, I do track distribution days. I track what's happening with TQQQ because that's the one thing that I do swing trade. So I really try to keep track of like how long do the shorter term uptrends last, how many days, what percentage 
percent does it go up before it starts coming down mm -hmm. to input that it just takes like a few minutes um and then i will go into my current holdings i sort based on both again like from both from a percentage up and percentage down basis and then i'll drill down further on anything where it looks like okay there might be something weird going on so i probably spend half an hour at the end of the day maybe 15 minutes to a half hour at the beginning of the day. Um, if nothing hits my alerts during the day, I'm still like around, but I'm not necessarily sitting in front of the screen. Mm -hmm. And then on the weekends, I'm spending between one and two hours. The exception would be that on a quarterly basis, I do definitely like to evaluate everything after earnings to make sure that even for things I'm holding, do I still want to hold them? Mm -hmm. So after earnings, I will probably spend instead of a few hours, I probably spend maybe depending on how many um, tickers I'm looking at, it could be even like 20 to 30 hours, like really just trying to drill down on is this something I want to hold like going forward. And I do also have a monthly process too, which doesn't take super long, but this was also something that I learned from how to make money in stocks, which was on a monthly basis, I take everything that I'm currently holding. And then I do in Market Smith the comparison chart, because I want to see like from a relative strength perspective in the past four weeks, what are my top performers and what are my weakest performers? Mm -hmm. And the place where that helps me is that as I'm identifying companies that I'm interested in buying, I already have a list of, okay, these are some of my weaker performers. So when I'm trying to decide, okay, do I want to trade this out and bring this in? I have like a small list of three, two to three tickers to go to immediately to say, okay, I'm going to start with these. And same thing when the market is pulling back, if it's like, you know, like a typical five, 8% pullback, I don't really care about that. That's going to happen when you're like in the, in the context of a bigger uptrend where I feel like we are right now. Again, when it was like 2021 and the market was choppy, I'm going to be much stricter. But when we're like now emerging after a pretty deep correction, I will let things pull back five, 8%. Like that doesn't really bother me. Mm -hmm. um, but I am definitely, uh trying to keep an eye on okay like if if the market looks like it's going to go deeper than that i want to try to get rid of my weaker holdings first and even though like my thought process when i buy companies i want to find the true market leaders the reality is and i think like bill has has you know i hear people mention this that have met him or had met him as well as he mentions it in the book if you have like 10 stocks, there's probably only going to be two or three that are your true market leaders. You're going to have some that are going to be stinkers and you'll have some that are going to be like average. So I always want to have an, at least a couple that if I need to get out of something quickly, those are the ones that like, I don't want to have to spend a lot of time on the week trying to figure that out. I have ones that are like, okay, if I have to get out, these are the first ones that I'm going to call for my portfolio. Yeah, perfect. And and for the stocks that make it onto your A-list, how many are you kind of focused on at any one time? Do you have like a kind of a max number that you'll keep on that list or it really depends on the market? You know, what what are the emerging opportunities? What's, you know, what, what's happening in the in the current context? So I think it's a little bit of both. So if I if I have a lot on my focus list, that's telling me that there's a lot of setups. Typically for my A-list, I try to keep it to like maybe five at the most. And the way that I'll call it, so for example, I can give you a good example of like, you know, recently when I was looking at the top 15, both um, Zscaler and CrowdStrike were on it. Mm -hmm. So from, and they're in similar industries, but when I was comparing the two of them from a fundamental perspective, I felt stronger about, crowd, about CrowdStrike. So ZS is still on my focus list, but when I'm looking at my, my A list, I have CrowdStrike, at least for now, and again, it, it can change from week to week, right? Mm -hmm. But for right now, like if I'm going to pick between two, you know, software companies and I want one, I would probably look for CrowdStrike first, assuming it sets up. If Zscaler sets up before, then I might rethink that. But because of like my intention of trying to hold things for longer and trying to get to what I feel is a true market leader, I'm a little bit stricter about culling things out before they make it to my list. Yeah, great. Let's let's dive into some charts and uh, to start with, I'd love to just kind of maybe focus on one stock. And if you wouldn't mind kind of walking through your full process of, you know, what do you look like? Uh, what do you look at in terms of the fundamentals? Uh, if you do any deeper research, maybe on the website, you know, what you take a look at usually and then also how you how you run through the technicals. But, yeah, feel free to share your charts and uh, we can dive in. Perfect. 
Okay, great. So, um, so one thing kind of in terms of my process over here, like where there's like the notes section, this is where typically like I will put like when I initiate a position and when I sell it, um, I want to do a better job of actually putting what my thought process is like in this, I would just put kind of like cryptic notes, but then when I'm going back a few years later and looking at it, I don't necessarily remember all the details of maybe what was going through my mind. I just have sort of like the facts. But so, um, you know, I, I tend to start with a weekly chart. I will look at the daily chart for my precise entry points, but like in terms of starting my process, I start with a weekly chart. Um, as I had mentioned before, typically like the quarterly earnings and sales are like where I first start. Um, and typically what I've, and again, like here the numbers <laughs> don't look good right now, but it didn't look like this when I first got into the stock. I will focus on definitely the latest quarter, but then I'm trying to look for at least some acceleration. And ideally it would be three quarters of acceleration. That doesn't always happen. Even if there's one quarter and if it's above 25%, then that will at least get me to like really start paying attention to it. It's interesting right now, even, even now for a firm, you can see here on the sales, their sales are growing. They have had three quarters of acceleration. Again, at the time I was buying, it would have been a lot higher than this. Um, but right now, a firm doesn't have the earnings I would be looking for. So at this point in time, they wouldn't be meeting my fundamentals. Um, when I bought them, so basically in terms of setups, as I said, when I initially um started getting into can slim, I would buy the traditional breakouts. I like cup with handles and I like double bottoms because typically those used to emerge after a deeper correction. And so many times those types of bases were like the, the early stage from a base count perspective. Mm -hmm. Once we got to flat bases or once we got to, for example, things like three weeks tight or whatever, many times it was after the stock had already gone up. And so since I was trying to capture so that I could hold for 12 to 18 months, I was trying to capture as close to off of the bottom, but still at like what was considered an acceptable um, buy point from Bill O'Neill's perspective. But over time, and particularly in 2021, when the market was getting choppy, what I have evolved to is I really do, since I set my stop loss based on the 10 week moving average or the 50 day moving average, usually it's the 10 week, I try to buy as close to that as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, over the years now, I've gotten much more comfortable about buying off of the bottom when it retakes the, the 50 day or the 10 week. The one thing that I do look for is I want there to be, and, and I am going to um, dive down more this year, hopefully into stands analysis because I had not, I have not done that, but I do look for like higher lows. So if you look here at the point that I was getting in, so I got in uh, on eight, six. So it was right here when it was like, re so this is weekly. If I go back to daily, you won't be able to see it unless I um, go back and change the date, which I don't want to do right now. But like, so when I got Got into this, it was just retaking the, the 10 week moving average. But if you look at this, you can see that it was making higher lows compared to here. So mm -hmm. I will not try to get in down here. I try to get in after it has already started making higher lows and it has retaken the 10 week moving average and the 50 day is starting to trend up. So if it meets that criteria, I'm much more comfortable. And so for example, if we look at this bar, so this was the week of eight, six, mm -hmm. it was 5.6% above the 10 week moving average. And so to me, I'm I'm trying to buy within, and again, I, I know ideally a lot of people like to sell for less than an 8% loss, but because I'm trying to manage to like the 10 week or the 50 day, as long as I can buy it within 8% of that, again, most of the time it's, it, it's less than 8% off of that, but like that's sort of the maximum that, so in this case, at the point that I bought it, it was probably around 5% above mm -hmm. the 10 week moving average. And I felt comfortable with a stop loss in that range. Um, and, then, and then what happened? So again, it like, so this is kind of where I bought it. Uh, the next two weeks, you can see it pulled back. But if you look down here, volume was tiny. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm looking for. So once I bought it, it retook like the 10 week on, you know, pretty good volume above average. It did pull back, but they were like inside weeks. It didn't at all like, I mean, here it closed, like just kind of on the line. But you can see the volume was very slow. And this to me is a normal pullback. It didn't look like anything where I'm like, oh no, like what's going on? Um, then I went to like this week and again, like it closed near the low of the range. So I wasn't crazy about it, but again, it stayed above the 10 week and it wasn't really 
giving me any danger sign. Now we go up here, here I started to pay a little bit more attention to me. This tree, even though I didn't sell at this time, I put this in my sell signal because it did gap up, which is great, but it closed near the bottom of the range. And here the volume, the volume wasn't actually too bad, but I was thinking that, okay, like I wanna make sure that it holds above the low of this gap. So I'm mm -hmm. gonna start like watching this on a daily basis, not just on a weekly basis. Then we get to this point here, which is the week of the 10th. Now I started to get a little bit like, and again, I, I can't really describe why, but it was up like 33% um, on high volume. And this time of year, typically, and again, now we're talking about 2021, which was a choppy year. Mm -hmm. I was starting to get a little bit like, okay, like it's gone up a lot. I need to really, really watch this closely because I feel like it could come down hard. And with a lot of the other indications that I had been looking for at that time, I don't have them like written down anywhere, but it was starting to feel like, I, like in some of the, the stocks I was looking at, I was starting to see kind of like topping action happening, which again, this happens a little bit later. I think this affirms still did pretty well but so I was starting to just get and, and I don't really know like I, I still do rely a little bit on like intuition and gut but what I feel is that once you've been looking at things for a while when it's your gut I'm not talking about emotions sometimes when it's your gut it's like there's something in your subconscious that's picking up on something that maybe your conscious mind isn't and it's kind of warning you so I was starting to get a little bit like okay, you know, it's gone up a lot in a very short period of time. I'm not that comfortable with where the overall market is doing. We're starting to get choppy. We've had, you know, since 2020, the market had done really, really well. I'm going to start, I'm not going to give this as much leeway as I normally would when I first enter a stock, say like a month ago. And so sure enough, like when I'm looking at my notes, the week of 924, which was like right here, I sold half of it. And Actually, if you kind of look like, so this is an IPO base, right? So up here, like it was actually starting to like break out of an IPO base, which normally is a good thing, but just, I was feeling like maybe it's going to form a handle or it's gone up so much. The rest of the market is like things, it just didn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got to 1019, the week of 1019. So again, here it had gone up like 30 something percent here again. It also went up like another 20% right around 10, 19. So this is the week of 10, 15. I just got out here. And um, again, remember at this point I was in the competition. Uh, I only had like two months left. I had very good gains and I just, you know, it, I think like if it was in a different account, I might've probably waited until it got to here and gotten out. Well, but I, I wanted to lock in my gains. And so here I sold on the way up. Yeah, perfect. And Getting getting more into your your actual buy of this, are you executing on the weekly, the daily chart? Are you waiting in toward, in, until the end of the week to buy? What's kind of your process like for for the actual buy execution? Yes, so for buy execution, I go by the daily. So I will use the weekly as like kind of my to put it on my focus list, or, or to put it on my focus list, also to put it like on like kind of that A list of okay, once I'm getting ready to buy, but for my actual point of when I get in, I do look at the daily chart or when it took this when it like came up here. Sure but I think yeah. I was just I was watching it, and then I got in on this day mm -hmm. and. You know, at this point, I can't tell you exactly why I picked this day versus like this day when it actually took the line. Maybe I wasn't paying attention that day on the market or whatever, but this is where I got in. Um, and it did pull back, but because it kind of like was hugging this line and because I sized to it coming down to this line, I, and you can see the volume wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get out here. So I was able to get in and I was fine. So that was my my entry point. Yeah, perfect. And um, I'm not sure if that gap was on earnings or maybe a pre-announcement, but uh, in, in general, how do you kind of handle earnings reports in stocks that you own, especially stocks that you recently, recently purchased? Yeah, so um, I have, it's, 
both good and bad things have happened when I have bought stocks too close to earnings. So most of the time, I try to wait until the earnings have come out before I initiate a position unless earnings are at least like a month away. Mm -hmm. um, so especially like I would say over the past couple of years, because things have been all over the place, um, you know, SMCI, that's that's another one where I waited to see what happened with earnings and then it like gapped <laughs> down like 20 something percent. So um, I, I, I tend to be careful around earnings. Ideally, like, again, if I bought in at an early stage base and I have a cushion, then I will hold because in order to hold things and have them grow for 12 to 18 months, you do have to sit through earnings. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. And um, it, it doesn't sound like it was in this case, but I was curious, I want to ask you about adding to positions that are working if you do that and if uh, and what in what situations you might do that if if you you know really think a stock has potential it's mm -hmm. it's created a new setup for you yeah so for the most part as i said my target position size is 10 percent there are two places that I, so like in the past, I did try to get in, like, you know, when I read how to make money in stocks, like he said, okay, like maybe you do 50% of your position. And then once it's up like 2% or two and a half percent, then you add more. I was not able to actually execute on that. Um, and I don't like to set up like automatic buys because then it doesn't like, I need to do it in order for it to like stick inside me. Mm -hmm. And so generally what I will do is I will, as long as everything else in the, the, overall, like the market looks okay. And it's emerging off of, like I said, it's, it's not like at an all time high, it's kind of like coming off of like, you know, the, the right side of a base. I will generally initiate a 10, 10% position. I do add the first time it comes back to the 50 day moving average or the 10 week moving average and bounces from there. I will also add the first time there's a three weeks tight mm -hmm. and I will typically add around 10% of my position each time. So what ends up happening is between my initial 10% and then adding to the, at the first pullback and adding the first time it's three weeks tight, I end up with like a position that ends up being somewhere between 12 and a half and 15%. And then ideally it grows from there. Um, so that's, that's how I approach adding. Yeah. And then uh, I, I find a question a lot of people have is, you know, what's kind of your target for number of stocks that you hold? And um, I'd also be curious to hear if you use any margin at all uh, in your accounts. But but starting with the position size, uh, are you kind of targeting, you know, six to eight stocks? How, how many in general do you do you kind of look for? Yeah. So I generally will target six to eight individual stocks and then I trade around a position in TQQQ. Mm -hmm. So um, six to eight, again, I start with the 10%. Uh, in the past, I used to um, like maybe sell half, but then what would happen is all of a sudden I would end up with a portfolio of like 12 or 13 different things. Like some were quarter positions, some were half positions. So the way I've tried to simplify that, and again, because I have a lot of different accounts between my various family members and even my own different accounts. So as long as the stock is acting right, um, I will try to hold it if I no longer believe in the stock or if it has met what I think is, you know, that it has reached its growth potential, at least for what I was expecting it to do. Or if there's something else that's in my A list that I would rather own, then I just get out um, and I will keep it in my like, like kind of like my universal watch list, because a lot mm -hmm. of times the stocks that I sold are ones that like in the future, they may pop up. So I like to keep an eye on them. But I found that like, if I keep partial positions, I just end up with a lot of different positions and then it's hard for me to manage them effectively. Yeah, for sure. And and you had kind of a visceral reaction to when I said margin, but so I'd love to hear your your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, you know, again, I think this might be sort of like that, that whole like, uh, you know, conservative financial underwriting side. So it's funny, I am willing to take a, a lot of risks with some of my money. And that was sort of how I first started trading TQQQ. And now I actually have very concentrated positions, but I have watched it so closely and I have traded it so many times over the last like six or seven years that I feel very comfortable even with bigger positions in that. But the reason that I never, there are a few reasons I never did margin. One is because for my IRAs, I can't. Yeah. Um, and and for my shorter term accounts, like because I I never really um, learned how to invest with margin, I just feel like I'm not willing to take that risk. And I'm now at that point where like I live off this money, and um, I don't even need like 
having these kinds of returns make it fun and they keep me like in the game and keep me in the challenge, but it's not worth the, the risk to me of like going on margin and then like, you know, kind of like losing it all. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm not comfortable taking on that risk. And that's why it's interesting. Like even in the competition, whatever results I've achieved, it's like, basically been there's been no margin um other than again tqqq which does have some leverage obviously built into it but it's technically not it's a leverage etf but it's not technically like a margin type of thing so i have not used margin in any of my accounts ever yeah kurt no that's completely fair um and i i think everybody's got their own risk profile you know what what they're willing to to do um and you know a lot of the names that we trade they're not exactly uh you know slow movers so they're, they're, no, they're not. no especially <laughs> you know a firm i remember this run i mean it, it can move i mean it moved 30 20 percent in a day so uh there there's certainly risk there um i want to dive a little bit deeper into your cell rules and maybe there's another example that's a more um typical cell for you but uh, i was i wanted to ask you you know what would be the technical reasons that you would sell a stock? Um, and maybe this is after considering, you know, we're 12 months in, you're already in long-term capital gains. What would cause you to kick it out and maybe look to, to you know, better opportunity costs somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of the, the, the biggest thing um, I would say is if it undercuts like the 10 week moving average or 50 day, that's definitely, if it does that and I've already like gained what I want in there, I'm, I'm out. For sure, like I won't even wait, but I can share <laughs> SNCI. Um, okay, so let me go back to today now or mm -hmm. the current date. And it, it happens that today was a pretty crazy day for SMCI. I don't know if you took a look at that, but yeah, that I'm not. I'm not in it. I'm not yeah, in yeah. it anymore. Um, but <laughs> yeah, this. Oh my goodness, yes. Now I kind of wish I was in it, but I, I I'm not in it. Um, but SMCI, hold on. It's had this. a it's had a crazy run. So just over the past yeah, year. I, uh, hold on one second. Okay, so SMCI. So when you talk about sort of some of those traditional sell rules, so let me go back to right. Oh yes, right here. Okay, mm -hmm. so I bought like in at the end of June. Okay, and uh, June twenty sixth is when I bought. And usually, as I said, I try to buy off of the, the 10 week or the 50 day. In this case, I kind of broke my own rule and I bought after it pulled back to the, the it was the 21 day. I usually don't buy off the 21 day. Like I will look at that more as like kind of a short-term place of where it should hold if it's doing well, but I generally will not initiate a position. But in 2023, I was having such a hard time finding things that met my criteria. Mm -hmm. And so this was where I um, kind of broke my own rules and I did buy this and it actually did did very well, very well, very well leading up to, to earnings. Everything looked fine here and then it did this. Now I did sell on, on eight, nine, when it gapped down like this, so you can see like it was up here, it gapped down like this, it closed below here. Normally I would have waited till the end of the week, but here I definitely sold a bunch of it. And then like two days later, I got out of the rest. So this would be like a technical sell rule for me that if it goes from here to here, I'm not waiting. You know, I did wait, I waited a little bit, but like normally if I saw this, then I'm out. And I still made a 12% gain on this, but like, you know, and I don't know, like to this day, other than yes, like normally I wouldn't have bought over here. I would have tried to buy closer to this, but from here going down to here, other than the fact that it just went up so quickly, I don't know how I could have really anticipated this. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, th that type of drop on earnings that can start a longer term decline, or it pretty much chopped around for four months after that. So there's opportunity costs. So, you know, that's, that's a key, you know, price and value signature that just needs means, you know, stock needs more time or, yeah. you know, something, something bad is going on behind the scenes. And this one ended up you know, working out. I remember uh, I got hit with Fastly in 2020, you know, there were the gap downs and that was in a decline for the next like year and a half. So um, yeah, makes sense. And um, 
are there any other sell rules that you particularly abide by? It doesn't sound like you sell into strength that much um, typically, uh, or you try to hold that full position pretty yeah, much. Yeah, I, I, I do. I do try to hold. Um, I think selling into strength, I do that with TQQQ, mm -hmm. but for the individual positions that I hold. And again, the, the main reason is, for example, like in my taxable account, if I'm selling into strength with the intention of buying back once it like comes down, 10 or 15%. If I'm paying like 50% short, you know, like in terms of the short term capital gains tax between the state income tax, the, the federal income tax, if I'm going to be, and again, like I, I, I'm not at all saying that people should make decisions based purely on taxes. I, I don't at all do that. But like if my intention is that I believe in a company and I'm only selling it because I want to buy it back if it pulls back 10%, then I don't know that I necessarily am going to sell something that's up 60% to buy it back, you know, if it's yeah. a short term gain to buy it back when it pulls back 10%. If I'm up 60% and I no longer believe in the company, then I will just get out of it altogether. Yeah, yeah makes sense. Yeah, let's dive into some other examples. And then I definitely want to uh, talk about TQQ and kind of your process for that. But yeah, let's yeah. run through these other examples here. Okay, so the other ones that I have, there are more things that are like on my fundamental focus list, but that aren't on my, um, you know, they haven't quite met my technicals yet. So do you want to cover that now? Or you want to talk about that after? Yeah, let's talk about that after actually. So yeah, let, let's, let's discuss TQQQ because I, I know a few people who kind of have strategies around this, they'll kind of hold a core and trade around it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and trade the, the more intermediate market cycles. So yeah. Uh, yeah. W what's kind of your process like for, for the TQQQ? Yeah. So my process for TQQQ. So originally when I started trading TQQQ, I had, you know, pretty small positions and, you know, like maybe like 5%, whatever it was. Again, it was sort of my way of like gaining some sort of leverage. And I started getting into TQQQ because a lot of the companies that were meeting my criteria were like, again, at the time, the FANG stocks are now like the Magnificent Seven. But generally, when I buy individual stocks, I want them to have the potential to double or triple over time. And these companies were already so big that it doesn't mean that they can't grow, but I was thinking like realistically. So, but yet they were the ones that were meeting all the criteria. So I wanted to be in them, but I thought I would rather sort of get them through TQQQ. Um, so that's kind of like what got me into it in the first place. So basically what, what I do with TQQQ, like from like a shorter term trading perspective is I look at, so, so, and it's funny, like when I had looked at like over the last several years, and I think a lot of it might also be indicative of the fact that like these magnificent seven stocks were comprising such a big percentage of the index and they were driving a lot of the gains. But the way that I sort of look at things is I try not to argue with the market. So even if like ideally I want smaller companies that are like more like the traditional canceling type of stocks, if that's not what's showing up and if that's not what's delivering performance, I'm not going to look for something that's not working. I'm going to say, okay, so how do I leverage something that's already working? And my way of doing, of getting into those big names and, and, but getting an oversized return was to go through TQQQ. So what I do when I talk about swing trading is I will look at like, I kind of, and, and it's easier sometimes to see on the, the chart. I have kind of my own way of how I, if I do this, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, but like on, on market Smith, like it will typically show where the peaks are and where the bottoms are. Mm -hmm. And I try to track like, what is the, from the, from the absolute peak to the bottom, what was the percentage like gain and or loss and how many days did it take to do that and i start like generally i'll start like in this case it was uh december 4th because that's sort of where the pattern began from like how i look at it but i will generally try to track like when, when the year starts i try to track a year at a time because like you know it, it will change from year to year depending on again if you're at the beginning of the cycle if you're in the, the middle point of the cycle and once it so like right now for example and this is where it was earlier today i don't know where it, i think it closed at 54 54. so for example like on 1228 it was 5201 was the last time recently that it, it had hit a high it was up 25 percent from where it had kind of like bottomed around 4173 mm -hmm. so now as it starts approaching this 25 percent i'm going to start selling into strength mm -hmm. um and i make that decision like today 
It did close at the top of the range. The volume was good. Again, it's the end of the week, but now I'm going to be, which I watch TQQQ very closely anyways, but next week I'm going to be watching this even more closely because this is where I'm going to start selling some into strength because it's already up 20% from like where it was here. And then I just kind of play those moves. So for example, like let's say I'm going to start taking some stuff off, off the top, maybe around 55 or 60, it's going to start pulling back. I'm going to wait for it to pull back, ideally either get close to the 50 day or sometimes TQQQ, I will buy at the 21 day. Like mainly I'm looking at the percentages. So for example, like here on January 5th, when it went down to 45, 47, it had come down 13% off of that 52 number. So that's what kind of gives me an idea of what to look for. And even if you can get a couple of those 20% move, and, and what I was finding, again, it varies from year to year. In choppy markets, you can, you can have like 30, 35% moves a couple of times a year. Like you can double your money. And it's not as easy as it sounds. It's much easier to see things in retrospect. But like for me, I've been like really watching this and looking at different patterns for like several years now. So I feel very comfortable doing these like short term swings. And sometimes, like I said, it's like, for example, like in, in uh, 2023, uh, I still remember it was like July 21st, I was visiting my brother in Denver that whole week, I was like, it was just like, <laughs> like, my gut was like, okay, like, you need to start getting out, you need to start getting out. And I, I remember I was telling him. And sure enough, again, it's not that I pick what the exact top is, but it's like when I start to sort of get that antsy feeling, I start getting out. And today I was starting to get that a little bit, but again, it, it the chart overall, it looks fine. And it's like taken out that 5201 high, but now I'm like just really starting to like watch it very closely. Yeah, perfect. And I want to dive into the chart a little bit more, but, but yeah. first looking at the spreadsheet, can you kind of walk us through the things that you're tracking and how you use this to kind of um, you know, uh, keep tabs on the overall strategy. Okay. Yeah, sure. So again, like I said, usually I start January 1st, but in this case, because we had a pretty good uptrend from like this point onward, when I looked at that 4173, it was on 12.4. So I, I put the date in, I put whatever the price is. And typically I'm looking at like, I, I want it if it if it drops just four or five percent, like I usually will not like like I might like put that in like today's thing just to kind of keep an eye on where it is. But mm -hmm. usually I'm trying to track if it moves down at least 10 percent or more because I want to try to capture those like if it goes down 10 percent, then I'm like here it went down 13 percent, then like it's going up like 20 percent. Like those are kind of like bigger moves that happen in the short term. So I track the number of days. Again, this helps give me a sense. So for example, right now, like today it was up 20% that happened in it or not today, but like over since uh, January 5th, it's been up 20%. It's mm -hmm. taken like 14 days to get there. And again, this is all just like math. It counts calendar days. But so, but here it had gone up 24 days before it started to pull back. So again, right now it's still too early in the year for me to like say, okay, there's a definite pattern happening, but this is what I'm using to start to build my my sense of how is TQQQ acting mm -hmm. during this stage of the cycle. I track the 10 day, the 21 day and the 50 day. I track both what the dollar amount is as well as what the, the percentage that it is. And by that, what I mean is that like, you know, when you look at the, the market Smith charts, it will tell you like where something closes relative to the 10 day or the 21 day. But I'm actually trying to find like what was the bottom or what was the top, not necessarily what the close was. And this kind of starts to give me again right now it's still very very early but like let's say if i'm doing this for like a couple of months or five or six months this particularly helps as we start getting into like sort of the end of the year mm -hmm. or as we start getting into those months that for me historically august has been a difficult month when it comes to tqqq it tends to like i tend to like have a lot more volatility this helps me get a sense of okay like once it is for example x percent above the 10 day moving average or x percent above the the 21 day moving average it's more likely that it's going to start pulling back so then i'm going to start selling into strength when it reaches those things um i do track like the distribution days um and and part of why i do this is again when i developed my original i only have like a handful of 
cell rules for TQQQ. They're like on a, a sticky note that I have on my wall. Some of them are selling into strength and some of them are selling into weakness. Um, but one of my ones of selling into strength is when the overall market starts showing distribution, particularly if there's clusters of distribution days, I'm going to be much more aggressive about mm -hmm. like selling into strength. And so here, for example, like, you know, the S&P 500, and again, I, this is whatever I have for the date here, I just update this sort of like every day to kind of get a thing of what's going on. But usually it's like today, 5462 was like the high compared to the last, you know, few things I was trending. That's why I have this in green, because this is kind of what I'm using as my peak right now. Right. But for example, when you look at like the distribution days on the S&P, it's 500. Again, like QQQ is going to be more driven by what's happening on the NASDAQ, but I'm just going to start sort of paying attention. And here I calculated that if it's like 54.62 is where it was when I looked at it earlier today, if it comes off 10% from this, it's going to be around 49.16. So that's going to like, I'm starting to like keep an eye on, I don't want it to get down that low. Like I want to start selling before it gets to that. Point. I don't know yeah. if that makes sense. No, for sure. So taking taking a look at this and looking at those those uh, those key lows that you're tracking the moves from, what what's kind of your entry point here? Are you are you looking to accumulate as it pushes off those lows? What what's kind of yes. the the point for you to actually start uh, accumulating shares? Yes. So I would say that like so here right like so this fifty two oh one when it came down here and again for TQQQ I will not buy like I, I start to buy as it turns around mm -hmm. so here you know it was down 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 this day which is the fifth um so it was a tight close it's 5.8 percent above the 50 day so this is like a good place for me to set a stop loss so I would be getting in here and going on the way up and then again like I said today it overtook this when I start to see weakness happening around here because again it's up already 20 percent from this I'm going to start selling into strength and is your stop loss right now is it is it still at that 50 day or have you moved it up to that kind of higher low that it formed just a, a few days ago yeah so right now for TQQQ, I don't actually have the stop loss at, at this. What I really try to do is look for when I showed you that chart, I'm trying to look for that. Um, I'm trying to sell more into strength mm -hmm. that when it feels like we're reaching kind of the top. So this is TQQQ is one of the few tickers where I'm really like trying to sell into strength rather than selling defensively um, from like that swing trading perspective. Yeah, for sure. And um, what type of position size do you usually use for uh, and kind of designate for the TQQ? Um, is, it, is it more than that kind of normal 10% to 50%? Yeah. It, it varies. Um, so I, I always, I'm always a little bit reluctant to share this because I think sometimes people just focus on the percentages and it can be extremely risky. And I don't know what the technical term for it is, but like, because this is not intended to be held for more than a day, even though I do, and I know other people that do that as well, when you have gap downs, it can like hurt you really badly. But for example, in um, Roth accounts, uh, sometimes it's close to 100%, 90%. Um, in general, like when it, when it's coming off of like when it, when the market first turns around after like a deep correction, I will generally like when when I don't even wait for follow through days sometimes. Like once we are like in like days four or five of a rally, even though there technically is not a follow through day, if I feel like we're making higher lows and higher highs, I will generally initiate like a twenty five percent position in TQQQ. And again, at that point, I am watching to make sure that it doesn't undercut. The the low of the rally day if it mm -hmm. does i'll get out and sometimes i have gotten in too early but many times what i found because of the criteria that i use to buy individual stocks i'm not always finding something to buy on the follow-through day right. so the way that i started to get in the market is i would get into tqqq and i would generally start with 25 percent. sometimes it's as high as 50 percent. and then when i start finding individual stocks to buy then i start selling down the tqqq and going into the individual stocks so i kind of use this as my i, I use it a few different ways. One is for swing trading, as I said, particularly for the account that we live off because I want to be able to get those 
25, 30% moves that happen over the course of a year because I need to, to take money out of that like mm -hmm. every couple of months, right? So this works perfectly for that. I also use it as kind of like my holding strategy for when I say holding strategy, that's not the right word, as my entry strategy for like when the market is coming off a bottom or when the market is coming off, even if it's an intermediate correction, if I haven't yet found what I want to buy from an individual stock perspective, at least I'm in the market and I have a logical place to get out if it undercuts the, the low of the rally day. And if it doesn't, then at least like my, my money is growing while I'm trying to find a better place to put it. Yeah. And, and how long have you been using this strategy? Is this, is this something you've developed over the past few years or you've been For using years. That? Yeah. So, yeah. So I would say that like it, it didn't start out at like, you know, the stuff that I'm tracking now that I'm showing you that stuff has been more over the past few years. It originally started out, like I said, of when I was finding that my portfolio was full of Microsoft, Meta, um, Apple, Google, NVIDIA, Netflix. And I was thinking, OK, like these companies are all meeting the criteria I'm looking for, but you know, they're not the Shopify. And again, NVIDIA like was at, at the time that I bought it in 2016, it was different, but now like NVIDIA is really big, right? And still because of AI and other things, I put NVIDIA in a little bit of a different category and I put Microsoft in a little bit different category too. Mm -hmm. But when I'm looking at kind of the overall QQQ type of stocks, I don't necessarily want a individual stock portfolio full of them. I would rather kind of get that through TQQQ. So when I initially started, it was my way of like um, playing like these big stocks, but still getting a better rate of return, I felt like because of like that triple le leveraging aspect. But over time, it has migrated into more of like a, a swing trade or trading in and out of a position. That being said, like when the market first turns, so like I first got into and and some of the general rules that I look at, which like for an individual stock, like well, I won't buy if it's below the 200 day moving average. Um, I won't buy if it's below the 50 day moving average. With TQQQ, I have you know, like I, I deviate from that a little bit. And again, it's from looking at it over years. So for example, I first, like after everything pulled back significantly, I first did my like pilot buy in TQQQ in December of 2022. Again, it was below the 50 day, it was below the 200 day. I think it was below the 50 day also, but it was just like, some of the other things, which again, I don't have them on a spreadsheet. I'm trying to do better now about documenting things because a lot of it is just from having looked at things so long. And again, I have my patterns of certain higher highs or higher lows or looking at like how much things, come, how much TQQQ comes off its high or how much it comes off the bottom. Like I will start entering and I have like, like I said, when it undercuts the low of the rally day, I get out. So like, I'm still limiting my risk, but so I initiated my, um, sort of sort of like what I call like my core TQQQ position in December of 22 in my the account that we live off it wasn't obviously my my trading account because that like reset like in January and so then I kind of add to it and then sell it from that point but I still try to maintain some core as long as we're in that longer term uptrend when we start getting into a choppy phase like we did in november 2021 i was getting out i will generally raise two to three years worth of cash because like the the bear markets i have lived through were 2000 to 2003 again i didn't have much invested but i remember the pain of that 2007 yeah. to 2009 the pain of that so if i have three years worth of cash then i'm not worrying if if some things that i'm holding pull back yeah that's confidence for sure yeah. And um, you mentioned uh, your sell rules into strength that you've got kind of five key ones. Do you mind sharing kind of what those are and what, what you kind of look for in general to, to look to make a sell? Yeah. So this is, again, these are specific to TQQQ. Mm -hmm. These are the things, if I see any of these things happening, it's going to, it's going to be in my head that, okay, like now I want to be much more aggressive. So for example, when it makes like a new 52 week high. So here, if you look, it is make it did make a new 52 week high before it was 5201 today it's at 5462 was the high of the day which is what i had on my spreadsheet from from earlier so generally when it makes a new 52 week high i'm going to start looking for okay is it going to start hitting resistance is it going to start like are people going to start locking in gains and so i'm going to start watching for that um, i also look for when there's new highs and declining volume so today it made a new high but the volume was above average it's similar to where it was yesterday so this isn't really triggering anything in my mind of, okay, this doesn't look right. right. Um, 
when we have four to five distribution days in the market and I look for again, NASDAQ. So right now the NASDAQ was at three. So again, it's not triggering anything there. Um, if it gives up the 10 day moving average, particularly in rising volume. So it hasn't done that yet. So it hasn't triggered that. If there's three consecutive down days in rising volume. So here, mm -hmm. so for example, when it went to the 5201, there were three down days, but it was in declining volume. Mm -hmm. So that for me, it didn't trigger like a sell sign. Again, I'm watching it because it is showing weakness and it did come down below the 10 day, but the volume was declining. So it is kind of an art, right? So I'm kind of going through what these things are, but then I sort of use that spreadsheet to say, say like, okay, what's been happening in this stage of the cycle? But let me tell you a few of the other ones I have. If um, it hits resistance and gets rejected three times. So for example, here, I like this 5201, it didn't quite get there, but like you could see that it was sort of like having a hard time breaking past that. Today mm -hmm. it did. So mm -hmm. that to me is a sign of strength. So I'm still, um, but I'm going to watch it because again, like it can start like backing down at any point. Um, also, again, if it has a poor close and rising volume below the 10 week, again, it's pretty far above that right now. Mm -hmm. And the final thing that I look at, which again, this is probably, it's really a secondary indicator, but again, it's on top of some of these other things. When the bulls versus bears, when it goes above 60%, um, again, that's very much a secondary indicator for me, but like based on when I've gone back and looked at for like my results with TQQQ, when that starts to get like very frothy, then I tend to get much more aggressive about selling into strengths. So, so these are basically like my list of sell signals. And again, if it if it hits one, I'm not as concerned, but the more of these that get triggered and, and TQQQ is the one ticker that I will sell. So for example, if it hits like two of these, I'll take off 10%. If it starts to sell more, like I'll start going down, down, down. I will typically try to maintain 25% as long as it's still above this. And as long as we're still in a stage two uptrend in the overall market. Yeah, it makes sense. And and this is kind of a nice performance booster in general. And like you said, when there when there's not, you know, many individual setups, you know, working, but the overall market is kind of coming off those lows, it's a really great way to get some exposure on quickly. And then you can flip that out to then, you know, finance the risk in other starter positions. So yeah. um, and, yeah, and, it's cool. and the, other, the other thing too, that's connected to this also is because it's so liquid, like I can trade size without, and again, not to say that my size is going to actually move the market. Obviously I'm not at all implying that, but I don't have to think about that. I don't have to look at, okay, like if I want to sell X amount and if I want to have a concentrated position, like what does that mean in terms of like, you know, how many shares I can sell? And typically the TQQQ is one of the few things that I will set up like an automated buy or sell, because if I'm not watching it over like the course of the day, typically like the spread is like pennies or a penny or less. Mm -hmm. So I will set, I'll use usually set it for like maybe for example like let's say if it's let's say if I wanted to sell it at 5454 and I want to sell like a lot of shares I might set a limit of 5452 because it's okay if it comes down a few cents I'm willing to give that up if it's you know if I'm selling a big block and potentially it could make a, a small difference but other but this is one where I will like sell in chunks I don't do all or nothing yeah it makes sense oh perfect um yeah, anything else with the TQQ strategy that you found really helpful or that you think other people watching might, you know, find interesting about how you develop this process, anything like that? I mean, I think mainly for me, it was trial and error. And that I think is sort of the biggest thing that that I can say, maybe this kind of ties in possibly to, you know, even like tips for people that the only way you know is by doing it. You know, it's very easy, like, you know, it's funny, right? When we went back and we set the dates back, like when you're looking at stuff now, January 19th, 2024, and you're going back and looking like a year in advance or two or, or a year back or two years back, things look so much more clear when you're doing it in the moment it's very hard to anticipate how you're going to feel, you know? So I think you just have to do it. You have to learn through trial and error. A lot of these, these cell signals that I came up with happened because of, different things that I experienced. Um, and, and I find that when I like stick to these, that I'm able to consistently capitalize. Again, I don't 
sell at the top and I don't necessarily get in at the bottom, but I'm able to consistently capitalize on 20% or higher moves a couple times a year. Um, mo most of the time, not always. And that you can have a very good, good year. I would definitely caution people that like, again, TQQQ looks great on the way up. It's very ugly on the way down and you just have to be really, really careful. Yeah, with everything that that moves quickly, you have to manage risk tightly. I yeah. mean, just look at it in March 2020, and that can. Oh give you yeah, sense of, <laughs> yeah. Um, great. And uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, looking back on 2023 in particular, how much did this contribute to your process? Because you know, this would have been a really good year to play those swings. Uh, you know, do you have a sense of how much that contributed to your to your overall performance on the year? Uh yeah, the bulk of my gains were driven by TQQQ because wow. there were ten tickers that I traded, seven of the 10 were down, um, three of the 10 were up, but of the three that were up, one was SMCI, which again, even with the gap down, like I made a 12% gain, but the 12% gain is not really my target gain because I'm trying to hold things for the longer term. It's generally not a swing trade. If, if, if I had not um, forced some of those other trades, my results would have been even higher because I was able to capitalize a lot on, on like these swings up mm -hmm. here. Like I, this is the January, uh, not January, July 19th. I was getting out here. And, and then you can see from 47, it went down to 35, then to 43, then down to 30. Like if you're, and again, in retrospect, it, it it's, becomes very obvious when you're in the moment, it's not. But if if I had really stuck to my TQQQ strategy, and again, part of it, like I'll be completely honest, in my non-investing championship accounts in 2023, I didn't buy anything other than going in and out of TQQQ because so many things just didn't meet my criteria. But being in the competition, a part of me felt like, okay, this is like a stock trading championship. And, but at the end of the day, what I came to realize is there is still skill involved in, in again, like in retrospect, these things become very obvious, but when you're in the moment, there is still a skill in kind of looking at this and being able to say, okay, this is a good time to get out. Um, or possibly looking at this and saying, okay, this is a good time to get in versus possibly it going even, even lower. Right. So, you know, at the end of the day, and, and that's why I said, this is probably going to be my, my last year in the competition. At the end of the day, I'm in this to like generate a good return and taking on a reasonable level of risk. And if I do that by swing trading TQQQ versus, you know, forcing positions that aren't working for me, I'm, I'm going to do this. Yeah, performance performance and rate of return is rate of return. So it doesn't really matter how you get there. Um, yeah. Would you be able to identify, you know, for 2023, the general areas that you were, you know, entering positions in TQQ and then maybe um, also, you know, where you were selling into strength for, for the past year? I don't know if you remember yeah, exactly, um, but... Yeah, I, I would have to go back and look because like I said, I... I um, this is the year that I really started to kind of do the spreadsheet more scientifically before I would just literally like write things down in a notebook. And it was kind of like in my head. I know for sure this day, I clearly remember because I was in Denver and uh, my brother, he trades TQQQ also. And this whole week I was telling him, you know, I'm just not like, it's going up. It's going up. I'm just like, it's like my gut is telling me like we need to kind of start getting out. Um, so this, I definitely sold a chunk here. Um, I did buy down here, but I still maintained a, even, even through this because I was up, I started buying TQQQ in uh, March of 2023. So mm -hmm. I still had like very solid gains. And um, around this, I was still above. And so I was giving my core position time to still, even though it was below here, let me look at the weekly. I know it, it looks so ugly. That's why I tell you, like, sometimes it's it's hard for me to, to, I'm trying to do better now about actually documenting what my thought process is, is mm -hmm. at the time. But um, I, I am willing to hold when it comes below, when it's part of, in my mind, part of a longer term uptrend. And if I have a profit cushion and it's a small core position, it's not like it was the bulk of my account. Um, mm -hmm. I definitely started adding as it was going up here. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time I got to uh, the end of the year, which was around here, um, I was pretty much like, you know, at 80% of what my 
or position is for TQQQ. When it came down here, again, this felt to me like an orderly pullback. Mm -hmm. So um, I had sold some into strength up here. I added that back down here. And then right now I'm holding. And again, I'm looking into where is going to be the right point to start getting out. Uh, but that's that's kind of like the best I remember off the top of my head right now. No, but this, this number perfect. here, this this for sure, I, I remember being in Denver and saying like, this is like, it's time to start getting out. Yeah. And, and you mentioned a feeling there. I don't, uh, it's very hard to like enunciate what what's creating that feeling, but it, you get, could you give it a best shot? What were you kind of thinking, feeling at that point that, Hey, you know, I, I should start letting some go. I think, I think it was looking at what was happening with the overall, there were a few things. One is looking at what was happening with the overall market. I'm sure like that factored into it. Also for me, when I look at like my portfolio and my seasonality, August, like, and we used to have my family, we have a joke about this because even when I was working at Aetna, like August, the first two weeks in August is when like all the executives would take time off because we were done with the quarterly business reviews, yeah. all of like the senior, senior executives were like off on vacation. So like, you know, there wasn't like that much going on. And, and a lot of times we would go out of the country and it was like, okay, whenever we're going on vacation, that's when the market is crashing and like my portfolio like is, is crashing. So somehow, like when it gets to the end of July, early August, I just, and that's why I was saying, like, I say it's a gut feeling, but it might just be that like over the years, like there's something that my, my subconscious is picking up on that maybe my conscious brain doesn't realize. Yeah. I just start to get antsy. February is another month like that for me, February and August. When I look at like the types of, of stocks that I buy and like how they do those months tend to be the weakest when I'm looking at my month to month performance. So I, so I think that's all it is, is I just like, kind of like look at it. And then the other thing too, is because I'm selling into strength and I'm not selling all or nothing, I feel like, okay, I want to lock in gains. And it just, I, I, I unfortunately, I don't have a better way to articulate. No, that, that's, that's a good expl explanation. I think. Perfect. Um, yeah, no, this, this is really interesting. You know, I, I, I know a few people who kind of have similar uh, strategies where they're, they're trading TQQ to kind of capture the swings. And uh, I think it can definitely be really good at, at those two goals that you mentioned, you know, playing those swings, but also uh, getting market exposure on pretty quickly. Um, yeah. And just one, one other yeah. quick, I just have to do a shout out to your um, old professor, Dr. Wish. I yep. had been like, you know, doing this Q TQQQ strategy and like I hadn't really heard anybody else talk about it until he mentioned that he did some analysis and he found that TQQQ outperformed something like 91% of, of and then I was like wow like so it's not just me <laughs> so I was so glad to have somebody else looking at it from their lens and their perspective and finding something similar yeah he, he kind of does that analysis during each of the kind of intermediate term moves and and yeah, typically TQQ outperforms, you know, 80 to 90 to 95% of the stocks in the, in the NASDAQ 100. So, you know, the, there's a strain of thought there, you know, why try to, you know, look for those outliers when you've got kind of a, a solid name that produces good performance during those swings. So, um, yeah, no, this is great. Yeah, and I think that's what's now led to sort of the final evolution of the strategy where I am now is that when I buy individual stocks, I'm only buying ones that have the potential to be true market leaders. That's my goal that I'm working on this year is whether it's between John Boyd's books or like some of the other research that's out there really trying to to nail down what are the true market leaders. Those are the individual names that I want to hold. Otherwise, like I, I'm having very good success with swing trading to QQQ. Yeah, great. And uh, do you want to kind of dive into some of the names that you're eyeing now that maybe yes. they're not set up perfect, perfect technically, yeah, sure. but uh, they're, they kind of meet your fundamental filters? Yes. So can you see uh, Decker's? Yep. Okay, let me get to the weekly chart. So, so funny story about Decker's too, like, so this kind of goes back to when I first started investing and I'd read Peter Lynch's books and, you know, he talked about like, you know, going to the mall and stuff like that. So when my daughter was 10, all of she and all of her friends for Christmas, everybody wanted Ugg boots. And that's when I realized Decker's made Ugg boots. And so I first, I mean, obviously like I sold it a long time ago, but Decker's first got on my radar screen when my daughter was like 10 and everybody wanted Ugg boots. So, um, so it's interesting that it's kind of back on here, but so let's kind of like start with the fundamentals. So if you look here, so one of the things that's really appealing to me is that it has had one 
two, three, four, five quarters of accelerating earnings growth with the last quarter being 79%. And typically my target is I want like earnings of at least 35 to 40, the higher, the better. I feel like I read something in how to make money in stocks where he talked about stocks that, that where the earnings are 70% or higher. Like a lot of times it's the beginning of a big move. So when I see something that has 70% earnings, it goes into my like watch list for sure. Here, the, the sales, it's go, it went from eight to 10 to 25. So we have two quarters of acceleration. Ideally, and again, it's 25% or higher, which is good. Ideally, I like, I would have, if the, if the earnings are 79, I would have liked the sales to be a little higher too, because my experience with earnings is you can, um, you know, I don't want to say massage or manipulate because it makes it seem like there's some bad intent and there's really not. But with earnings, there's different adjustments that can be made that sometimes make it harder to really know what's in those numbers. It's harder to do that with sales. Mm. So, and at the end of the day, you can't like shrink your way into growth. So like, Ideally, we'll see more acceleration of this, but this right now meets my minimum criteria from an earnings and sales perspective. Mm -hmm. Then I go back up here, like the EPS rating is 99, composite is 99, though I look for, again, generally when it's in the top 15, uh, IBD 15, it's going to be like in the high 90s, so that these numbers look good to me. The accumulation distribution is A-. minus. And it has an up-down volume of 2.1. Again, that's telling me that institutions are supporting this. Um, when I look at the RS line, I'm just going to draw like a little or put, put a, a line here. Like, so this, this here is basically like 18 months. And generally, uh, even if there's overheads, which sure, there's really not overhead supply, but like kind of like if you look at over the, the lat, like from this period onward, the RS line is like entering new high ground. Yep. Um, so that's something that's very promising to me. Uh, the number of funds, again, tie, I'm jumping a little bit all over the place, but looking at kind of like the number of funds, they every uh, quarter, the numbers have been going up. So again, institutions are adding to this. Um, the thing that to me here, like it's, it's I, and, and I didn't buy this here, I would have bought it, like if I was paying attention, which I wasn't, like this came across my radar now, but now it's a little bit extended based on where I would prefer to buy it. I would have preferred to buy it here as it was bouncing off of the 10 day moving average. Um, I would have gone to the daily and right here, like it's six, so this is kind of, it came down. I wouldn't have bought here because it's still kind of showing weakness. I would have bought on this day, which I didn't, but like under my, uh, like for it to like meet my technical and fundamental criteria, I would have bought off of this bounce, um, which I didn't. Um, but now for me, it's a little bit extended. And again, this one, like generally if you're looking at a more traditional base like if it's a cup base it looks kind of like a cup base it's kind of getting rounding here like the the volume that the, there's not too much volume at the bottom of the base but generally a cup base is at least six weeks and this was a little bit less than that it's five weeks I don't care about that as much but since I missed this right now I would be looking to see does it form a handle or does it kind of tighten up I'm not ready to enter it right now but this is definitely one of the ones that is on my my radar yeah, um, interesting enough, this was like one of the first ones to move. I think this was one of the first earnings gaps off the bottom, you know, a, a month or so ago. It, yeah. it was one of the first stocks to make a move. So it's definitely got some RS going for it. And, and just looking back in time, uh, this has been a long term leader. So that's that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, like right here, like this, like, look at this, this is beautiful. Like it went up 16% this week on like high volume. This is after earnings. So yeah, like if I had been looking here, I, I generally have not bought off the the, the 200 day, but the th or this is the, 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 the 40, 40 week. week. Yeah. But the thing that's very cool here is in this one bar, okay, 40 week, like the, the 30 week, the 10 week, the four week. So basically, again, I don't really look at the four week per se, but mm -hmm. I just have these on here. But it it like took out all of the the shorter term ranges as well. So to me, that that's a sign of strength. For sure. Do you want to look at any other ones or? Yeah. What, was there another that you wanted to go over? Well, this, this is really the one right now that's number one. Again, I also have CrowdStrike and Elf, but those are not... Um, Again, I, they aren't ready to be bought at this point, but they also had strong fundamentals. Yeah, perfect. I think we can call it there. We've gone through a lot of uh, great charting and perfect. You no, know, I, I really appreciate you going through uh, definitely a methodology for TQQ. I, I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in that. And I always like to kind of end it off with some more kind of uh, general questions. 
um, and we were talking a little bit earlier about this, what kind of advice would you have for traders who are starting out, you know, developing their systems to just kind of, uh, you know, look to solve the mistakes that they're making and, and just kind of improve as traders? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is to know your style. And so, for example, a few things. One is, you know, are you more of a swing trader or are you more of a position trader? And sometimes when you're starting out, you might not know that. The way you know that is you see how you react, right? Like, so if you, you know, if you have a stock that's up like 15%, you're like, oh my God, I got to sell it. I got to sell it. You're probably better off being a swing trader. If you're somebody who, you know, like you, you want to hold it until it goes down to the, the 10 week moving average, but then it, you know, it, it's going to be like 11 or 12% drawdown and you can't live with that. And you end up selling like right at the drawdown, then you're not good at, at being a position trader. So some of it is trial and error. So the first thing is to know your style. The second thing is you do want to put the time in. I've had like so many people reach out to me. And they're like, can you just tell me what you buy and when you buy it? And like, how you buy and I'm like but that's me so even if I tell you and there's so many people that have services out there but like I'm not you and you're like you have to you have to know how you react to certain things and so you you the only way is to put the time in and I think luckily like again I like I was mentioning when I started like I would be reading books on the plane you know but now like there's so many you guys have awesome like with, with Trader Line you guys have a ton of super helpful um, webinars where you put frameworks where you like help people get started I would really encourage people to first learn and then the other really important thing is then you have to start because you can spend as much time as you want absorbing information, but you have no idea how you're actually going to react until you're in it, but start small. And these days it's become so much easier. Like, and again, like sort of like, okay, you know, and I had to walk like a, you know, 10 miles in the snow, which I'm not that far back, but even for me, like I had to generally have a couple thousand dollars worth before I could initiate a trade because the commissions were high and you had to make at least 10 or 15% just to break even between like you're buying and selling now, because commissions are so low, you can buy fractional shares so there's no reason to not start you know start small and and um so i think that's the biggest thing know your style just start somewhere and then you and and the third thing is you have to give it time because and when i say give it time i'm not saying like obviously like if you're if you're crashing and burning you, you have to protect you know you need to protect your 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 capital and so you need to have a plan for like when you're going to get out you need to protect yourself but like if you're starting a system and it's been like a few weeks and it's not working that doesn't necessarily mean your system doesn't work like it might just not be the right time like you might not not you might not be doing something correctly so then if you have like a string of a couple of of losses then just Take a step back, pause, try to figure out, is it your execution or is it your strategy or is it just that the overall market time is off? And then the final thing I would say, particularly for people that are starting out is, you know, people that are experienced, they can start from the ground up. If you're just learning, like I still would kind of keep in mind that thing of like three out of four stocks follow the general market. So even if, if you want to be like a growth investor or like a canceling type of investor, you need to at least be aware of what the market is doing because when yeah. you're starting, you want the odds in your favor. So the, the, those are my tips. Yeah. And what, what I have to say kind of ties in perfectly to, to several things you mentioned there. Learning the concepts is one thing, learning technical analysis, fundamental analysis, you know, Bill's framework, which I think is a great way to start, you know, uh, other methodologies, stands, that's one thing, but to really have to apply it and actually put your hard earned money behind it, that's going to create emotions. You're going to, you're going to make a lot of mistakes because we're human. Um, and that experience is just what you need over time to make the adjustments, realize who you are as a trader. Um, and like you did with the TQQ coming up with those rules, you only knew those rules because you actually experienced it and lived it. You know, looking back in time on the chart of TQQ, it's easy just buy here, sell here, but it, it's not as simple, you know, in real time. So that experience plus the concepts, you kind of have to couple those two and you need that seat time to put everything together. Um, and that's that's what I really love about these interviews. And that's why I love doing them is I get to hear everybody's, you know, lessons, uh, different styles. Like you said, not everybody's going to be a swing trader, not everybody's going to be a position trader, but everybody mentions, you know, all the things they learned, like Sean Ryan, who I interviewed a few weeks ago, he, he, he got to learn from David Ryan, his dad, who is obviously a fantastic trader, mm -hmm. but he still had to learn the lessons for himself and learn his style, which is different than his dad. So 
every single person, it, it, it hurts to lose money, but you're going to have to lose a little bit of money to learn. And that's why you start small. And then once you prove it to yourself, you gain confidence in your system. That's when you can trade with bigger size and, and you know, your, your whole account if you start with a small portion of it. So, uh, sorry, that's a bit of a tangent, but I think it ties into a lot of what, what you said. Yeah. And like I said, when I started off, I lost 80% when I was in my, you know, late twenties and now here, I, I learned a lot from that. And so if you are going to lose money, you're better off losing money when you don't have that much to lose <laughs> than when you have a, when you have a lot more. So it's good to, to learn. And, and the bottom line is you're, you're going to lose money. You just have to know how to learn from that and how to create rules that help protect you the next time. Yeah, for sure. And, and a lot of the lessons that people share here are risk management is rule number one, cutting losses is rule number one. And if you can start with that as your base, you're going to succeed over time because you'll figure out all everything else out because you'll be able to protect your capital and still still be able to trade. So absolutely. Yeah, no, that was a, a key point that I should have said. And I didn't even when we were talking about the tips. One is that you need to have a, a comprehensive trading plan. Your trading plan has to not just include what to buy, when to buy, how much to buy, when to sell. And that was for me when I first started out. All I knew is what to buy. I didn't know when to buy. I didn't know how much to buy. I didn't know when to sell. I added those over time. But if I were to go back to my like, you know, 28 year old self and say where to start a 30 year old self, I would say, make sure you have all those components. And again, you can tweak them and you're going to refine them over time, but you need to have a rule for each of those things. Otherwise you don't have a complete trading plan and you're going to lose money. Yeah, perfect. Well, I, I really enjoyed this, Viva. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm sure everybody watching did as well. Um, if you did, pl please leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel for more interviews like this one. Um, is there anywhere people can reach out to you if, they, if they'd like to learn more about your process or if they just like a, to get in contact anywhere that you would point people to? Yeah, sure. So right now, like primarily people can reach me through LinkedIn. I am, um, I'm going to like just bite the bullet and finally go on X. I had kind of resisted that because it used to just be like so much information, but um, I am planning to, to join that and I'll share that with you so you can add it, you know, to your, to your site. But I love connecting with people generally. Like I would say every week, at least one or two people reach out to me. And I like to talk to them one-on-one -on -one and, and um, I enjoy doing that. So people should feel free to reach out to me via LinkedIn. Yep. Perfect. Well, thank you again for, for your time. Congratulations again on your performance, not just last year, but the many years before. Uh, it was a pleasure having you and uh, yeah, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Richard. Yep. Thanks everybody. We'll see you guys in future videos. Take care.